happening now. We want to welcome our viewers from across North America and around this is the EdTech Situation Room. Good evening, my name is Jason Neifer and I am the Tech Savvy Administrator for the Northwest Council for Computer Education and I'm the Assistant Director of the Montana Digital Academy, the state virtual school located in fabulous Missoula, Montana. Good evening from Missoula, Montana, where the weather is beautiful outside tonight, days of rainy weather, which personally I welcome in the middle of July. It beats Montana on fire in August. And joining me as always, Leslie Fryer. Wes, how are you this evening? I am good, and I'm hopeful my bandwidth will be okay. Uh, am I sounding okay, or am I cutting out? You're sounding great. Okay. A wonderful looking background tonight. So you yeah. have that nice porch look. You got the festival lights up. It's quite a view. Yeah. And was, the sun has gone down now. It is not not cool and mild here in Oklahoma City. We were in the 90s. I, I don't know exactly how hot. We haven't really hit a string of hundreds, but I did return from a great week in Colorado offline at 9,500 feet above sea level where we had to wear our coats and jackets and got cold and had fires and all kinds of great stuff. And I am the director of technology at Cassidy School, a wonderful independent school about seven minutes from my house here in northwest Oklahoma City. And um, I'm uh, excited to talk about Pokemon Go because looking at the show notes that Jason put together, that uh, I, I'm, I think it's safe to say that will be a significant part of our conversation tonight. I think so as well. And in fact, now that I think about it, there is one other article that I neglected to put in there that I'd like to do as our top story tonight. So we have story, a uh, 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 lead audio, like a shugung, the top story in the education situation room. So um, the reason why I mentioned this is because uh, the three or four times in the last two weeks, and I can't believe I didn't think about throwing this article in. I will throw an article in the show notes. But last week, Evernote announced it would be utilizing a new uh, structure for their uh, pay plan. Uh, this is after a lot of restructuring on Evernote's new CEO. And there have been a couple of things I've noticed in the past six months, including last week's announcements. The first one is that they're no longer um, uh, uh, on the iPad or Skitch on Windows anymore. Skitch is now only a Mac OS, um, I guess it's now Mac OS um, platform, and for those of you that haven't used Skitch, Skitch is, in my humble opinion, by far the best screen capture and uh, software platform available. Um, it's something that started off kind of with, it kind of felt like it would be a kind of a um, star and emoji adding prospect to photos and over time power users. And I know Wes, you've used Skitch before uh, to much uh, much effect. It has a very distinctive um, but Skitch um, was no longer available on iOS or Windows. And then the announcements last week was that Evernote, the parent owns the Skitch app, is not only increasing the prices for its premium product, it is now limiting Evernote to devices per person on the free plan. So that means if you have a desktop and you have an iPad, you couldn't then use it on your cell phone access on one of your other two devices. Uh, this is a big deal for me. I was a pretty consistent Evernote user, but let my membership um, in January because, frankly, I wasn't using it as much anymore, but I do still have a large data archive in Evernote. It's not quite as useful to me um, at, at $60 or $70 or $100 a year, which is the, the price level of the premium price plans. But I also found Found out quite disturbing to me. Um, the Skitch app on Mac used to be what I thought was the best PDF annotator. You could take it and add lots of great, great air. Uh, this is particularly useful for me in my day job as the assistant director and curriculum guy for the Digital Academy. We'd often send reports to folks that needed it on a PDF report to see where data was located. That is now also a premium only feature. Um, this, in my humble opinion, uh, Mike, for this as a platform, um, I, you know, frankly, if I were using it every day, I should be paying for it. And in fact, I may chip in to get that sketch because after searching for 20 minutes today on my Mac laptop, I wasn't able to find a similar PDF annotator that does for me. 
But I do think that this is the core of the problem with using free products in your classroom um, in, in um, you know, it's, it's one thing to use one-off tools here and there, but you always have to be super cautious that at any time the business model could change and you're suddenly not free anymore. So Wes, to you, I mean, obviously I, I know that you're a Skitch user. Um, I, I remember that it was something you were actually uh, utilizing um, as part of your son's participation debate. Um, I remember that that was something you were um, kind of pushing against uh, this note as a platform. Have you used it lately, and will this impact you at all? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge user of, uh, of both. And on a, on a technical note, you were hopefully, I don't know whether what, if the bandwidth is at my end or not, there were a couple cutouts that you were doing. So give me a, a hand signal or something like that if, if I start to cut out. Okay. Um, but right. I, you know, Sketch was one of those things that, at ISTE, you know, six or seven years ago, probably, I think Mark Wagner, we were sitting in the bloggers lounge and he just happened to mention it. And it's this life changing app that literally I use every single day. And I don't, I, I don't know if I can say that for other apps. Evernote is probably, you know, in that boat, uh, Google Docs is as well now, but, um, yeah, I was really bummed. My wife, uh, used ever or used Skitch a lot in her classroom for her, with her students, uh, iPad one-to-one, -one, you know, just to, just to take a, a picture and mark it up, you know, and annotate uh, flower petals or, you know, parts of a, uh, some kind of an object or I don't know, they, they just did that a whole lot. And um, if any app developers, I'm sure there's thousands, literally, they're listening to our podcast with bated breath, just waiting to hear the next great idea that we're going to share. Um, I mean, that, that's, a, that's an important niche. Um, of course, you know, Sketch has been a free app. So your point's well taken that when we rely on free apps, these kinds of things happen. But um, yeah, I haven't felt the pinch on Evernote yet, I think, because I'm just getting, just using it pretty much on my, on my laptop via the web. Uh, and then I'm, I primarily use it on my phone. Um, I, I think I've installed it before. I tend to not like installing extra things that, you know, put stuff up in the menu bar and just, you know, tend to bog things down. And periodically when a new operating system will come out or I'll be fortunate to, to be able to get a new machine, that's always nice to have it cleaned off and then just kind of start over because the more things like that, that you put on, the slower your machine goes. So I uh, was, I had heard, I'd heard about the, um, not the price increase, but uh, about the limitation on the numbers of devices. Um, Evernote's one of those things for me that's just become my offboard brain. And I think that's a, that's an important thing from a learning and uh, sort of inspiration standpoint, um, if uh, anybody is, has heard of Stephen Johnson's book, Where uh, Good Ideas Come From, one of my favorite books of all time. He has a great uh, P PBS series. Um, you know, he, he talks about the Renaissance and the, the idea of a commonplace book that many writers of, of, the, of the Renaissance, you know, did, and, and also authors, you know, C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, different people over time, having a place to put your ideas, to trust that they're going to be available to you, to get them out of circulation in your brain, you know, and then have them somewhere else that you can go back and refer to is really a huge thing for productivity as well as just for ideas. So, yeah, I'm going to try to, I'll go to my bandwidth and see if I can ratchet it down here. Um, I would also say that uh, one of the killer features on Skitch that I have, um, <laughs> every time I show it to someone on a Mac, they can't believe how easy this is. And the feature is that when you Skitch image, there's a little box at the bottom of the image that allows you to drag it around into, like it'll create a file, right? So you can, without even pressing a save button, you can just drag it to your desktop and it creates a file. The other thing it does is it allows you to drag it from the, directly into a Google document without cutting or pasting or doing any sort of magic there. And I love that. That's spending, uh, Wes, you mentioned before that Google Docs is a daily driver for you. It's a daily driver for me, too. I'm constantly doing documentation in Google Docs. I'm constantly working on student um, uh, site handbooks that involve a lot of screenshots and the ability to drag that capture window directly into Google Docs without me upload this or input that is magic. And I do think there is a, there's, I would pay for an app that does that. In fact, I do pay. 
pays for Snagit, which is a wonderful screen capture app that's that's kind of like um, Skitch on on um, on Prentice zones is that it doesn't do that like it doesn't do that drag thing and so there's there's a marketplace piece here for someone to make a great screen um that, that does pretty amazing things by the way the other thing that i use it almost constantly for is that there's a one-click share to the web that put l in your memory so you can paste it into chat um the gentleman i work with at the digital academy that i'm on constant communication with we use sketch screenshot a time to show each other things and that app is is magic and it's probably going to cause me at some point to pay the 50 70 if ever it is like it's so valuable to me that that's something i would probably do but i do think and i'm sure all the the evernote uh, executives are listening to the podcast tonight but one place where i think there's a, a a real downfall here is that i just can't imagine using this in a classroom anymore trying to make and uh, you know different devices, and frankly, it counts me out as a free user because um, I well I, I own ridiculous you know numbers of you know download Evernote to all those, but trying to manage you know uh, even three devices, which is not an uncommon phenomenon for a tech savvy person, your tablet, your makes it I think really challenging. I, I get they need income model. I was a a a, a customer at a probably the sixty seventy dollar but it would cause me pause before doing that in a classroom. Yeah. On a technical note, I have adjusted my bandwidth to low bandwidth, so hopefully that's that's going to be a, a little better. Uh, it also could be my laptop. I know we were kind of blaming your Chromebook a couple weeks ago, possibly. Um, I'm still using this MacBook, which I absolutely love for, for you know being on the go and doing just about anything except presenting, which it actually bit me pretty hard at both iPad Palooza and at ISTE. And then, you know, with video conferences, I've, I've done some with Zoom, but this may be my first Hangout. And it may be my last, you know, Google Hangout with, uh, with the MacBook, because that, that actually could be the problem with it, not being able to keep up with the processor. Sure. Um, and one, uh, I would one, say an editor's... Oh, go ahead, Wes. One other sketch note is that I mourned the acquisition of Skitch by Evernote because one of the things they did when they took it over was they eliminated my one of my favorite features, if not the favorite feature, which was the direct upload to Flickr. You know, yeah. I will I will wear a black I will wear sackcloth to the EdTech SR podcast if at some point um, you know Flickr is sold and and is is you know divested or is is done away with you know if we lose because I I don't know I have almost fifty thousand images on Flickr now I think and so Sketch being able to grab a screenshot put an annotation on click one button boom it's on Flickr you know and then readily uh, embedding that on a blog post uh, or or doing something else with it I I miss that workflow it's one of those workflows that I miss and, and feel less powerful because I don't have it. So it, it can be a sad thing when a great developer gets gets snatched up by a larger a larger fish. Um, that was definitely the case with Posterous years ago when, when Twitter got them and, and they just completely died. Uh, although they you know there's there was some spin-offs and some companies promising similar similar kinds of functionality. So let's hope we don't have to completely mourn the demise of Skitch, but it is sad to see and um, you know, it's gonna it's gonna cause us to look at other uh, other tools and other options. Um, you know, I, I don't know how how fun I've been using with Google Draw more, and so I don't know what the viability of uh, a screenshot into Google Draw. You know, with a couple shapes. I don't know. It's not gonna be Sketch, but that's yeah. what we're gonna be doing is looking for alternatives. Well, and then let's talk about those alternatives for a second. There was, and I tweeted a lot about this last week, or maybe it's two weeks ago when when the notice came out. Uh, obviously, OneNote is in a great position to kind of take uh, uh, those that are sad of, of Evernote's demise on multiple devices in the free plan. Um, I will tell you that um, I've used I find it a little harder to wrap my brain around because I just haven't quite adopted the notebook versus uh, page versus their their sure of information is not like Evernote, and that doesn't make it bad. It just makes it me, means I have to relearn it a bit. Um, and there, and I did go through Microsoft has the go to OneNote conversion tool, where you can take your Evernote um, uh, data file and it converts it to OneNote, and that was a successful. Pro 
Um, I should probably put that in the, the show notes somewhere, um, but uh, I've also tweeted about it um, at Tech Savvy Teach quite a bit as part of that process. I will tell you that my original use for Evernote was to just put down stuff that was quick things. That was the best thing I thought about place to put things both Google keep which is the Google note-taking application that plugs into drive is a good right. alternative for that right one that's a great alternative is simple note which is something that I only recently um, uh, uh, started using um, it's a free the reason why I like Simple Note is because it's text only. There is no images. And so what I've used, and it, by the way, it's got browser extensions too, so you don't... Hmm. Use full use out of it. I email text again. That's something that's very common in my day job. And so I've used Simple Note as a uh, infrastructure for doing that. And so for those who look... Those are, are excellent alternatives, but um, the bottom line is, is that you know, in a free tool world, um, uh, you know, you you using or you know, if you're using some kind of freemium model, which is free plus features that you pay for, this is the risk you take. Tools and um, you know, of course, I, I wish Evernote the best. I want them to be profitable. I want them to continue to, to push Sketch because it's still my favorite screen capture tool. You're at risk when you utilize these tools in context of, of your workflow, whether you're just a knowledge worker uh, that's outside the education world or you're so either way, you're taking a risk by, you know, putting your stuff um, in these these capsules uh, app wise. Agreed. Agreed. OK, Wes, you want to take us to our next story? I will. Um, I think, you know, actually. <laughs> You, I hadn't realized that you would put this article in in first, and then and I'd put it in lower, and I deleted. It. I said, "Oh, look, he's already got that." But, but Ars Technica reported here on July seventh that ten million Android phones have been infected by all powerful auto rooting apps. And so, um, a couple couple things about this. I, I know we're going to talk about Pokemon Go, and we'll we'll be talking among other things about the security issues and the patch and and those kind of things. Um, an essential part. Part of being digitally literate today is keeping your stuff up to date and keeping it patched. And uh, I, as I read that article, I'm pretty sure that you know it, it's some older versions of Android that are susceptible. And so, if folks are running the latest versions with with new security patches, you shouldn't be susceptible to that. Um, the second thing is, you know, th thinking about installing things that aren't from the Play Store. I think that that article also talked about. The, that danger um, of, of installing things from other places. Apple, a number of years ago, you know, created this system where if you are installing an app not from the App Store, it's not from an approved developer, it's a third party, you know, you've got to do a special authorization to allow that. And um, I think those kinds of safeguards are good. They're kind of like, um, roadside barriers, you know, that, that companies are trying to, to put on the road to, to try to help you with, you know, from, from going too far astray and, and from having, having problems. Um, I have personally not experienced a nightmare scenario because of, you know, jail, jailbreaking an iOS device or, I mean, there's a, I have, I have a little bit of Android experience and, um, you know, I, I, I haven't rooted my, my uh, Android tablet and, and I've certainly, you know, played around with hackintoshing netbooks and, and other kinds of things. But um, it just, it's really important that we update our devices and, and that we keep them updated. And that's, you know, one of the biggest reasons why we have huge denial of service attacks, DDoS attacks, you know, is because people are running old versions of, of computer software. Uh, heaven forbid, we've, I'm sure, got people still running Windows XP and maybe, you know, maybe even some older systems. And so those uh, are just very prone to hacks and, um, you know, it's we're we're uh, we're uh, almost we're pretty much an entirely iOS based mobile mobile family. Um, you know, we've just dabbled a little little bit in the Android world. And I mentioned a few shows ago, I'd I'd had an airplane experience sitting next to somebody who just about had me talked into going Android. And then you know, my my children uh, threatened revolt if if the transition to different iOS devices that came down from parents was it was interrupted. But anyway, I think uh, security is. 
now that I've been a technology director for a year, I mean, I found myself uh, in, the me in the few messages that I did send to our entire uh, faculty talking about security more than anything else. I'm, I feel responsible for that, right? And so um, it's just something we got to keep talking about and we got to keep encouraging people. And there's, there's a interesting separation, I think, that um, my wife went to a PO meeting last night, which she's one of the younger younger women there. Uh, it's a group of group of older ladies, and it's a it's like a service club, and and kind of I don't know exactly how to describe it, but she is now regarded as one of the techie people, <laughs> and she didn't feel that way when she used to work at our church. But you know, she's been back in the classroom three years. Their iPad one to one. She's doing all this stuff, and I don't know. We were talking about this last night. How you know. And I don't know if it's because some people of a certain generation don't necessarily understand technology or people just like to put a label on you. But anyway, we're using lots of devices and, and uh, you know, whether whatever identity markers you have for technology, um, it's something that we got to encourage people to be aware of and be uh, very uh, diligent about trying to do with their own devices. And it affects us in schools to the extent that, you know, these devices can be brought on campus and we got to think about how we segment things and protect things so that the virus that you bring, you know, to my school doesn't affect the rest of us and, and bring us all down. Yep. And I would also say that they're in the same way that, that 10 years ago, very innovative schools are bringing parents in to teach them about Facebook and social media. Um, you know, find the advocates in your school that can teach classes to parents and uh, also be doing with your school or your students as well. Like if you have folks in your building, whether it's, it's, it's students or teachers or parents, and help on these very issues. We started uh, earlier, Wes, you mentioning that, um, you know, you need to be digitally uh, savvy enough to be able on your phone and know that the update notification is not something you swat away like a fly, that there's something you, you have to do here. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, I'm an Android user. Um, I get razzed by that by my iOS friends uh, quite a bit. Um, but it's an open, op more open platform than anything that Apple puts out. I have to be on top of that. In fact, one of the reasons why that I utilize a Google Nexus phone, and for those of you unaware of the, the Android universe, uh, Google puts phone every year. Sometimes they refer to it as a reference design that they want to put out a phone that they design so that other manufacturers can know what a great phone looks like. The reason why I like the Nexus phone as my daily driver is that Google provides me monthly updates and in some cases more regular updates when tools become available on that platform and um, other phones don't do that. Now I would say that Apple's ahead of most manufacturers like Samsung and, and, and LG in that way, but, you know, I think it pays for you to know that. And unfortunately, the people that should be able to help us, so Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile employees oftentimes don't have or have no economic interest to help you keep your old phone and sell you a newer phone. So extremely well uh, taken point. And, you know, you'll see a story like this probably three times a week on technical blogs, um, and chorus of stories deafen you to the real reality, which is you have to be on top of this stuff. And I appreciate your encouragement as far as the parent side. We uh, brought Carl Hooker to our campus in March and did a really excellent series of presentations for students as well as two parent presentations about digital citizenship. But what we really need to do is that regular discussion. And um, as we as we kick, get back to school, um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try to to do that as far as getting some things scheduled at least two or three that we can put in for the semester. We may not catch many parents. We probably won't. You know, everybody is so busy. It's really hard to get people to come face to face for something. You know, but what? But maybe it'll be Pokemon Go or maybe it'll be you know something else. Just it's always a moving target. Uh, and I think the bar continues to be elevated as far as the expectation for what people need to to be able to know and be able to do uh, and and to be aware of and it's and it's more than just you know what those kids are are up to now and what app you know they could be doing illicit things on that's a part of the conversation too but this part of it as far as the updates um, it's it's important and we're not doing a full BYOD we allow students at our uh, high school our upper division to bring devices uh, but. Um, you know, it's, that's, this is the future, the multi-device universe with yep. 
you know, consumer control devices that the IT department does not exclusively control. And so architecting our, our networks and our, our access, and then also trying to educate folks um, about security policies and best practices and all that kind of stuff. It's, it, it's part of what we need to do, so. Yep, absolutely. Okay, Wes, where should we go next? Uh, why don't we, you wanna do the, the uh, the oblique fact you want to do that uh now instead of instead of later or do you want to save it um sure let's do that now it's a good segue to then what i'm we're kind of bearing team on go but that's a great idea so uh, i'll start um okay. uh interesting fact about me and my family um i my wife is allison she's a, a, a philanthropy um uh, uh, professional for a, uh, an environmental nonprofit in montana but uh we and we don't have kids we have uh that we are likely to be parents next year, not in that way, but we're going to have an exchange student for a year from Sweden, uh, not this coming school year, but the next year after. And so awesome. uh, make a precursor uh, uh, trip to Sweden to, we've met uh, this, this student and his family. It's actually when Allison was a, uh, a student, they had a Swedish exchange student that was a family friend of theirs um, that, that came to them. Um, and uh, this is uh that their exchange students' nephew will be coming to stay with us, kind of continuing a family tradition. So uh, we may be parents for nine months. <laughs> and you know, they'll, they'll come as a high school senior. So it's kind of actually our dream of kids. So we're we're pretty excited about that fact. And it means that probably sometime in the next year, we're going to make a tr trip, which Allison tells me, if I go to Sweden, I will never want to come home. So that's uh, a threat maybe of the trip, but we're really excited about that. What about U.S.? That's awesome. Oh, I'll share uh, just a, you know, kind of parenting thing. We have we have a big transition year coming up with uh, two of our three kids going to different schools. We had all three of them in the public magnet school downtown in Oklahoma City last year, and so our son has graduated, and have, I, I wrote one post about this and uh, need to kind of write another one as far as where we are in our journey, but he's going to the Colorado School of Mines, and so Friday we were there for orientation and um, all kinds of excitement surrounding that. And also, if, it's like every emotion, you know, because, and I'm not intensely, you know, just like, you know, crying or something as far as I'm leaving. But, you know, there is an element of, of sadness and seeing uh, the march of time and how we're getting older in these things. But, um, you know, it's, there's, there's fear and concern as far as uh, the financial side of this and, and how all these pieces fit together. But uh, it was really my favorite part of this orientation. And last September we had um, traveled there together and I just, I learned how he found out about it. He loves magic. In fact, he had three, four friends over tonight and I cooked burgers for him and, and they were playing this game, magic card game. Well, he had read on Reddit uh, about one of the uh, drafts for magic at school of mines and that they had this great club. Anyway, that, that's how he learned about the school. Now he's interested in engineering and all of these kind of things, but it was through the, the magic, um, you know, subreddit or whatever that he learned about the school. But um, my favorite part was listening to the students talk. And this, this really is a school that's not, not much of a party school. I mean, they, the kids are very, very serious um, in terms of, of their academics. I think they had 33 to 35% female last year, which was, was an all-time high for them. Um, but it, um, you know, pretty much everybody there is an engineering major. But it was great to hear the kids talk about their, their journeys. You know, of course, some of them came in as a you know, chemical engineer, and that's what they've done all four years. And, and then other people have kind of changed their majors four or five times. Um, but I didn't realize that students uh, in engineering can get internships even after their freshman year. And there's some with the Department of Defense, um, even that are here in Oklahoma City, that they pay like $30,000 in the summer. So we're like, you need to check into that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's uh, it's an exciting journey. And uh, I'm looking forward to having our youngest daughter go to school with me this year at uh, Cassidy. Uh, where I'm the director of technology. And um, we're we're marching forward with, with life. So, nice, um, nice. Let's go. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't you take us into Pokemon Go and uh, tell, tell us the EdTech situation room angle on this whole phenomenon that has so many people going wild around the world. Well, um, so it's interesting because this has been a pretty dominant conversation amongst my circles. Um, my offices are on the University of Montana 
actually uh, a, a doctoral candidate at the University of Montana in teaching and learning, uh, with a specific focus on ed tech. And so I had a long conversation with my, or in the chair of my dissertation committee, um, a shout out to Dr. Martin Horaji, who is a faithful listener of our program. And um, he um, about today, and I started to put some things together that when I was putting links together for tonight's show, I finally came to um, uh, kind of full circle with what we were talking about today. Pokemon Go is a is an app that's apparently taken the world by storm, and basically it's a it's a uh, um, uh, uh, not a vir virtual vertical to call it a virtual reality uh, app. Uh, augmented reality, right? Yeah, it's an augmented reality app, which means that you don't put a you don't put any any listeners are not going to see my my awkward kind of uh, facial uh, 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 gestures here, but you don't put a mask on to play this. By uh, your cell phone screen, and so it takes a picture of what's in front of you and utilizes it in addition to a neighborhood with a very impressive Pokemon theming to it. And basically, it's a game that encourages you to walk to various locations, play the game. And there's a lot of, of complexity to it if you get deep inside of it, but you can incubate and hatch Pokemons and go to what's referred to as gym to increase your skill um and there's a lot of, of interesting pieces there to make this um uh you know kind of a, a, a an interesting reaction why it's taken a uh, uh my interest is because it has gone from being a an, an early app that was kind of saw into the community and apparently there are millions of players around the world that are taking advantage of this particular application and so anytime that there that um, you know catches so many people's interest. It's certainly worthy of a discussion inside the education realm. So I have shared some links tonight. You can get those at, at edtechsr.com, where we post every week's show notes, so you can see some of the things that we're reading to kind of inform our views on these pieces. Um, but but foremost, this looked really familiar to me, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And then tonight, it struck me. This is just like Google's in that was released, I think, in 2012. And Google uh, Ingress was a very popular game. Nerds played it for a long time and had almost a, this gameplay where you would walk around a neighborhood based on a map that's founded on, on top of Google Maps, and you could go and capture base side and dark side to take like a sci-fi Star Wars thing um, and add it to the game. And Pokemon Go is exactly the same thing thing and company that developed Ingress. And the difference is, and this is where my conversation with Martin today became so interesting, Ingress has been around years and was very popular with nerds for a long time, but this adds the added piece of nostalgia to it to where Pokemon fans from years ago can kind of relive that with an augmented reality game. It's, it's quite of an impressive thing. I've, I've only played for it for literally three minutes and then I download the game, signed up, put my phone up, and I have a large Android phone. Um, you know, and there was a screen and some dinosaur looking in the after my, my salad day, so I couldn't tell you one thing about Pokemon. But you know, a little clicking around, capturing something that looked like a dinosaur. And, right. And you know, then it showed me a park in my neighborhood that I could go that was called a gym that I could go gather skills. There is a literal gym in my neighborhood that the YM street that I could go to for additional uh, training. Um, but people are reporting that people are walking 10, 15 day, um, you know, looking around for additional Pokemon, you know, energy bites. Now it's where I'm going to get in the weeds, right? Um, but this is, is obviously this is, you know, the first really wide implementation of an augmented reality game that's captured but there's all these stories about first people that well some guy got into a car wreck apparently last week because keeping an eye on his pokemon game and there was uh i don't really know if there was a pokemon in the middle of the street or what it was but he was Pokemon going at the same time and, and apparently got in some kind of accident um people have been mugged where there are prominent names 
Pokemon. So people sit around waiting for people, you know, apparently staring at their phone to show up to look for the Pokemon. And that, and in a, in a less serious case, restaurants where there are prominent Pokemon, prominent and rare Pokemons located are reporting an uptick in their business, meaning that, you know, people are choosing restaurants based on the availability of local Pokemons. So I get <laughs> first, Wes, have you installed the app? Are you Pokemon going in your neighborhood? You know, I'm not. One of the things um, I don't think you mentioned yet was the Google permissions issue. Yeah. Uh, one of the issues, there's, I guess when you have any phenomenon that millions of people are going to start playing within a week's time, there's going to be all kinds of things that happen. I mean, in, in Wyoming, somebody found a dead body when they were searching for a Pokemon. You know, I think that was just an accident that, that happened. Um, one of the big things involves permissions. And on a, on a text standpoint, we ought to be aware when we install an app or when we go to a website and log in with Google or Facebook or whatever, and we say, hey, I authorize you to do such and such, you know, what are we authorizing? And I think probably 99.9% .9 or whatever of people, you know, just click through those things and don't even, you know, think twice. But one of the the biggest issues of this, and it's kind of amazing that this happened with a noted, you know, app developer and the profile of this, is that by logging in with Google, you gave access completely to your entire Google Drive account, read, write, and if, you know, you were to be hacked or this particular developer was going to do something malicious, I mean, your entire Google Drive universe, you know, could be could be deleted. I mean, I'm sure Google would help you get it back. And I don't think any of that happened. And the patch actually just came out yesterday where it no longer does that. And both Google took steps yep. to address it. And then the app developer did as well. But uh, yesterday at work, uh, we have something called iTunes family sharing set up. And what that means is for our, our two younger girls who are our minors, when they want to install an app, not only because we can just use a shared credit card um, and, and, and be able to, to uh, you know, manage the, the purchasing of apps, but whenever they want to install an app, it'll pop up on my phone, my wife's phone, or our computer and say, hey, you know, Rachel wants to install Pokemon Go. And so before I said no, I, I texted her and just said, we're going to wait a little bit, you know, because of the security. And then I said no, and, and I need to tell her now that it's probably okay for us to, to do it. So we are not doing it yet. Uh, cautionary tales as far as security. I definitely think, and, and you know, the profile of, of Nintendo, I don't know how much their stock price went up, but it was a substantial increase, you know, with the release of, of this app. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it does kind of show a... A herd mentality when it comes to the installation of apps and thankfully in this case it appears that that security vulnerability was not exploited but there's a lot of potential you know to whether it's a herd mentality or it's just some you know something that a hacker has has gotten a hold of that um, you know we can be giving the, the virtual keys to some really important parts of, of our lives aka all of our Google Docs or it could be Evernote or, or whatever uh, it could be kind of the dark side of single sign-on, right? Um, because you might allow allow people into all kinds of things if you're entrusting uh, lots with that one one login. So I definitely want to check it out. Um, you know, on that note, I'm I'm excited about Google Expeditions. We talked about that a couple weeks ago when we were actually at ISTE because uh, we have a bunch of the Google cardboard uh, glasses to to start exploring. I love how this brings together the world and gets us out into the world doing things, and it overlays you know GPS yeah. with virtual with gaming I mean with a lot of different things and one of those articles also I think talked about the founding company uh, was like keyhole and this was an original company yep. that worked with Google Earth you know doing uh, cool GPS stuff back you know not that many years ago and uh, I, I love geography it's one of my favorite favorite things and so I, I like that whole nexus and, and connection and so seeing this as far as a, a breakout viral augmented reality uh, game is exciting and I will also continue to be looking for how students can create those kinds of things because you know I'm a big fan of digital storytelling of right. just oral history of history in general and the the idea of you know 
being able to not only go out into your community or being on a trip and getting to, you know, hear stories about this building or this place or what happened here in history. Uh, but now there's going to be, you know, it's like the Jedi Council or, or the holodeck, you know, hey, let's, you know, see John Luke Picard, you know, appear here or Yoda is going to be here or, you know, Buffalo Bill <laughs> or, you know, all, all kinds of possibilities. And thinking about shifting our students again from the consuming seat into the producing seat, you know, and how can, you know, how can we move into that kind of space? I, I love that. So it's going to be exciting to see how this develops, especially with regard to empowering people to create similar things uh, themselves. Absolutely. And, and of course, there's been a ton of extra media on this. And by the way, for those clue about what the heck, uh, um, uh, Pokemon Go is and want a, a good primer, there is a link in our show notes again at edtechsr.com about from Lifehacker about what what is Pokemon Go and what what you know why is people why are people so excited about it? But a couple other interesting references that of course um, you know, kind of the ed tech blogosphere has has grabbed a hold of this. And uh, there's an interesting article from Idea. FM about the 14 reasons why Pokemon Go is the future of learning, and it's a great article. I'd suggest you read it. Although with everything, I think there's a caution to say that you know we've been talking about the future of learning quite a bit the last three decades, and you know it's it's like every other tool. There's something here, obviously, because it's rolled by storm. But whether or not it's going to have, um, you know, whether or not it has the lasting solution to education, which is always my problem. You know that that it, it's. I think it remains to be seen. You might remember for those of you that remember Second Life, um, uh, uh, a long time ago, which was a place that for a while had taken the education room by storm. You know that was supposed to replace all of schools. Um, MOOCs, uh, the big phenomenon, you know, three or to you know the future would be only 10 universities would exist and they would offer MOOCs to everyone else. Well, that those aren't going to come true as it turns out. Um, and with caution, but the bigger thing that I found that I just absolutely loved was that the uh, Associated Press Style Guide people that put out an update every year to the style guide of how to refer to things. Uh, it's mostly related to journalists, but I also um, uh, uh, buy a study every couple years to, to help formalize my writing as well. And uh, two things actually interesting lately. First of all, they announced a couple weeks ago the internet no longer has a Internet is a lower I uh, phenomenon. That's a side note. There's no link there for that, but I've stopped using a capital I on the internet. And then also, they wanted to use a tweet there from those folks that are, um, you know, about what po Pokemon Go is. Uh, first one is that they, they say that there's no accent any in their, the official version of Pokemon Go. Um, the a plural of Pokemon is Pokemon. And then the best advice ever, use sparingly. However, Pokey Stop is okay, which is a reference to the game itself. So, um, yeah, I love it. Uh, uh, it and, and again, that's the internet, right? No, you know, the, the AP Style Guide has been around forever, and, you know, only in a world where social media exists can get a very breaking news phenomenon and release a, uh, an authoritative note on the grammar um, and Formal writing that has any sort of authority. So, uh, by the way, I love following uh, following AP Style Guide on on Twitter because there are you know things. It's an interesting commentary on news that takes a kind of, and I'm not a grammatarian by any stretch of the imagination. My writing friends, including my my wife, can tell you that. But I love though. So, um, yeah, make sure that you use Pokemon correctly in your writing. And um, one, one more Pokemon thing, and then maybe we want to transition to your disruptive uh, articles. Um, as they always do, the folks at Common Sense Media did a little review yesterday of Pokemon Go and on the topic of digital citizenship and, you know, equipping our parents and other folks in our lives with tools to be able to be savvy and make good choices. Common Sense Media, I think, presents some really, you know, balanced reviews of movies, of, uh, you know, video games, of apps, of all kinds of things. And so if that's not part of your repertoire of resources to turn to, uh, it's definitely a good one to add, and that's a good one to show parents. I think 
they do have a digital citizenship, you know, sort of certification program. We're in the midst, and I actually I need to I need to get the survey, and maybe next week I'll I'll have a have that as a shout out for people um, to do a little survey because we're wanting to to learn more about what schools are doing around digital citizenship, and then you know develop a specific curriculum that we're going to be utilizing at our school. So kudos to Common Sense, and I think they gave it a three out of five, and some of that just had to do with the security concerns and things like that, but those are things that are being addressed, so perhaps their rating will rise in the coming weeks. And then I have a couple stories. We can go through this somewhat quickly because it's turning uh, it's it turning to my regular topic, like this week in industries that don't look um, A couple of interesting things. First one, Twitter, um, which has announced um, that they will be um, broadcasting the conventions via their app. Um, Twitter, I, I think um, one could argue, is desperately trying to continue to be relevant users uh, uh, relatively quickly. Actually, I had heard somewhere that Pokemon Go had more active users right now than Twitter did, which gives you a sense both of how it started um, decreasing a bit in its its market share, but more importantly, how impressive Pokemon Go is. But um, for those of you that have not been keeping track of um, uh, Dabble in media, they have bought and right, or they've bought and, I'm making up words, they have purchased rights to uh, broadcast on games this fall via Twitter. Um, they also tested some of the live sports thing. They actually had some Wimbledon coverage uh, last week via um, the app, although I never saw any of it. I'm a daily Twitter user, and I never saw any reference to that, so I thought that was kind of interesting to read that after the fact. But I think that you know, TV as you know, we knew it in the 80s and 90s is, is continuing to you know, evolve and different and the fact that you don't have to turn to NBC or CNN or C-SPAN to get convention coverage you can just pull it up on an app to do so I think is an impressive thing yep absolutely I I concur the other thing I'd say that relates to that is that huh you know it's it's just challenging as a parent as well as uh, an educator uh, thinking about gatekeeping content um, uh, I won't don't want to embarrass her and call her out, but one of our children, uh, we have two girls. Um, you know, last night was watching something on YouTube on her phone, and we had had a conversation about well, you know whether that was appropriate or not, and trying to equip her to make make good choices. And you know, yep. we actually canceled a subscription. There's this Teen Safe app which uh, uses your uh, your iCloud backups to be able to see text messages that your kids have sent. Uh, and, but the, the mobile app, all it does is it locks apps. So you could like freeze the phone to shut down internet access or, you know, turn off apps and things like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm on a quest for additional tools. Um, not only because it, it has been and can be helpful, you know, to read some text messages and to be able to uh, have some conversations with, with our children about those things, but also in the capacity of being a tech director, I, I want to be savvy about different tools and be able to, you know, give options to, to parents and things like that. Um, so it is exciting to see the continued fracturiz fracturization, if that's a word, of, uh, of media and, uh, you know, niche media and, and opportunities like Netflix to, you know, be able to binge on Madam Secretary, which my wife is doing kind of again for, for a second round. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also challenging uh, in terms of the gatekeeping of the content and and really the huge influence which these which these platforms have. You know, we've noticed that this summer with our girls. I mean, they're probably as influenced by YouTube and things that they've uh, watched via uh, the internet than, you know, almost anything else in their lives. It's been an equal influence, so... Absolutely. And, um, you know, along those lines, the other two articles are, are, aren't as deep or just kind of bigger pictures. ABC has some web or actually app only series. So it's free digital only shows that you can watch only on a mobile device. I think can continuing in this and the fact that they're developing content that only exists on a mobile device is fairly interesting. And then this one's probably maybe a, a longer discussion for another episode because I, I so the digital citizenship topic we keep going back to, but there's an interesting uh, bit of Pew research that says that um, while people are overwhelmingly uh, their news from social platforms, they seem to also say they don't trust the news they get from their social platforms, and that uh, that that tension that 
important topic that we probably um, should should dive a little deeper on. But um, you know, I know that I pretty rarely go directly to it. The sole exception is I'm a subscriber to the Digital New York Times, and on Sunday with my iPad with a cup of strong coffee, I love to read the Sunday news. But when it comes to the daily news, I don't even go to local newspapers anymore. I trust entirely social media to point out what's going on and then look up stories in that way. Let, let's definitely put this on maybe for next time to talk about because, you know, one of the biggest things we haven't even mentioned, you know, is, are, the, are the shootings that's happened of uh, blacks by police and, and the, 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 you know, killing of those five policemen in Dallas and the role yep. that social media has played in that and, and the iconic images now that have been captured in Baton Rouge and other places and the ability of folks to, to be digital witnesses and, um, Almost, it reminds me of, uh, and I'll admit that I didn't read the whole original, but <clears throat> Immanuel Kant. See, I'm going to bring this up to impress <laughs> my, my debate friend, Jason, um, had a, an essay called, um, I think it was called Perpetual Peace. And the thesis of it was that eventually open democratic governments were going to have you know, such transparency to what was happening with warfare that the reasoned leaders of these uh, just societies would would say no. We're not going to resolve our our differences through violence, and um, it's int- it's caused me to think a lot about that. And we can we can maybe de- delve more deeply into that uh, in in an upcoming show. But essentially, I think it's really good that we have visibility to some of these things that have been happening in our society, but perhaps they've been hidden or they just haven't been documented to the point where they're, they're being addressed. You know, I didn't go in and watch e- any of the, of the live stream deaths of these guys being shot, but on the same, but, but that being said, you know, I'm glad that we're not ignoring them. And, and yeah. I, do, I do believe that there are some really big issues that we have in our society of which I am only partially aware, you know, living as I, as I am, as a, as a, I guess I'm a middle-class white, white guy. Um, I know I'm a white guy, but you know, I mean, not, I mean, we're not, we're not super poor. We're not, you know, uber rich, but you know, there's, there are, there are things, you know, and, and friends that I have that, that can speak to these kind of things, you know, um, you know, as an African American, as as a Hispanic, as a woman, you know, depending on the shoes that you wear, you just can't re- you can't know all of the things that that people uh, see and experience in their lives. And so, anyway, I think that t- technology is playing a huge role in that yeah, right now. Uh, and we're having debates about that, and and that fits right into your disruptive you know title in terms of the ways that those things are challenging traditional notions of how we get our media, our perceptions of danger yep. and chaos in the world, and um, also the roles that we have to play uh, because we can potentially be digital witnesses as well. Absolutely. And that's what was stunning in particular about the Minnesota video from last week is that, you know, uh, and again, we, we, we work hard to not make this a political show. I don't think you want to listen to Jason and Wes's political tirades, but um, the, the, the one thing that is true is, Single to that is is that um, you know you can do a you can make up a lot of supposing related to you know what happened or what didn't happen out of particular tragic situation, but um, you know and, and and the video isn't always clear about what the situation was, but it's going to put you in a place you wouldn't be able to understand unless you were really there, and that's that's extremely powerful. And um, you know I hope more people that are oppressed cell phone cameras and broadcast of Facebook. And, you know, I, I think we had mentioned Facebook videos being a pretty interesting tool when it first was released several months in an earlier uh, episode of this podcast. But the broad, the, the bottom line is, is that it's, it's pretty amazing that you can press a button worldwide audience. It's even more impressive than YouTube was when it first allowed this. And here's a, here's an idea. And I, I think I'm going to try a different laptop because I'm, I've, continue to have some difficulty. I'm hoping that our audio will be this pristine, wonderful file and, and it'll all be good. But uh, maybe we could think about doing a Facebook Live uh, broadcast. I don't know though that we can do that as a as a two camera operation. Anyway, we'll have to we'll have to explore that. I'm just gonna have to travel to Montana and we're just gonna have to be face to face again. Jason, that's that's all there is to it. Yeah, we'll just, get just, a little studio and uh, live every week and you know uh, with impressive lights and stuff. But yeah, I, I think this is a this is a topic we should 
a little more deeply on. And by the way, if you are teaching social studies or English language arts or communication or speech or any of these, uh, uh, add some some advocacy to things. You you should be teaching about this stuff, right? Like that's Absolutely. democracy is is vastly different in a world. You can have one press button broadcast of your dire situation that you're in. And, and I think it's an important piece that, that, that we have to keep an eye on. Absolutely. All right. Well, should we do some geeks of the week and get out of here? Geek of the week time. Um, I'll go ahead and run first. Um, uh, that happened to me about a year ago, actually. Um, I was recovering from a uh, major surgery. I was very bored in, in Seattle and, um, I, because uh, it would look like a good deal. And it was uh, one of those little 11 inch Lenovo laptops that are becoming somewhat popular. And it's uh, um, it was something that, oh, I bought it. It's a rugged, wonderful laptop from the rugged standpoint. But I assumed that if I just dropped an, an SSD or solid state drive into it, no matter how, what the chip was, it would be fast enough or modern enough to be a super fast laptop. And what I figured out pretty quickly was that it was good for basic tasks machine. And something that I've been really conscious of in the last year is that there are ways that you can test how fast a laptop is. Um, you know, like what it feels like, although the feel is important, there are benchmarks you can utilize. And so I dropped a great link in the show notes again, EdTech, uh, where all of our show notes appear, um, to something called the Octane Benchmark from our good friends at Google. And the Octane Benchmark is a one will uh, uh, allow you to uh, test how fast JavaScript is in your browser. And it, you know, no benchmark's perfect. And benchmarks to get higher scores than they deserve. What I love about this is that I figured out over time that modern laptops aren't necessarily laptops. And PCs and Macs, uh, which are sometimes hard to compare, um, you know, when you're buying a higher-end Mac, it's not just the pretty probably also buying an advanced processor as well that you may or may not understand that's the process. And so I would suggest uh, it's, it's a one-click test. Start it um, on a browser. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, for example, is that Chrome OS is uh, way faster than Mac OS or Windows. Cool. Small footprint browser that you know it feels fast on a slow processor because it is a lot faster by objective measures. But to benchmark, it gives you a score, and I run that over different computers now, and I have a pretty good sense on what a fast computer is versus a slow computer is. Um, so I would suggest you do that with your computer at home. You can compare your laptop and your desktop, and your your school laptop and your home laptop, or your your laptop and your spouse, and have an objective way of measuring speed. That's not something that's just a subjective feel. You could actually look at how fast your computer cranks through. Um, which would mean how fast it feels when it's processing information for you to serve you in that context. Awesome. I will definitely check that out. And uh, I will probably be retiring my, my little MacBook here from video conferencing uh, after I have that definitive, this sucks, <laughs> <We're speaking laughs> results, which I don't know if that'll prove it or not. But uh, my Geek of the Week is uh, kind of a little just fun fun one that I learned about from uh, my, my friend Shannon Force, who probably is not listening, but uh, he always has uh, cool little apps to check out. It's called Hyper. Uh, the Twitter handle is Watch Hyper. And Hyper is a crowdsourced video app that will give you and then and the ios app talks about offline so maybe it'll actually download them kind of like uh youtube red i haven't actually tried that part of it um but it'll ask you some questions like are you interested in you know tech uh science in um you know pop culture i don't know there were like three or four questions um but uh, i i'm very interested in these algorithmic tools that kind of crowdsource things this isn't doing it in a super personal way and i don't know that it's going to be kind of learning as a as a sort of machine learning that as you click i like i like you know you're going to you're going to get more of those kinds of videos but um one of the first ones that i saw was like call the city and i'm just a real sucker for time lapse videos i mean i love to watch like clouds going over the mountains and the sun moving and and this one was just all kinds of 
uh, traffic and uh, cranes and, and things sure. in the city changing and stuff like that. So anyway, just, just kind of cool. And uh, if anybody else has any of those sorts of crowdsourced apps, um, the one that I shared in my BYOD session at, at ISTE, in addition to Flipboard and Pocket, was Nuzzle, uh, because Nuzzle takes your PLN or your, your professional yep. network that you've created on Twitter or Facebook, and then it says how many of the folks that you follow are liking this article, you know, and that's, it's a really, really powerful yep. tool. I guess maybe I'll drop that in because I'm kind of cheating and doing two, but anyway, check out Hyper and it is a free video crowdsourcing app to get you entertained and allow you to waste even more time looking <laughs> at inane videos that you wouldn't otherwise uh, spend your, your waking moments and heartbeats looking at. Well, thank goodness, Wes, because, you know, frankly, I don't have enough digital distraction in my life. And in fact, there's an article I'll push to next time from Walt Mossberg talking about that we need to come to terms with the over notification in our world. So we'll leave that as a teaser for next time on the technology situation room. So, Wes, tell us where we can find you on the Internet. I am W Fryer on Twitter. My blog is speedofcreativity.org. I have been actually working rather frenetically, getting ready for some iPad media camps. Uh, my wife is participating in a three-day one next week for three days uh, using some curriculum that I've developed, and I'll be going to Tulsa, Oklahoma, Thursday, Friday next week, and then doing a three-day here in Oklahoma City the following week. So that is iPad Media Camp on Twitter or iPadMediaCamp.com. And uh, the thing I'm most excited about, I guess, is a matrix of activities and media products that is like 20 four of them, I think, that you can make with your iPad divided into four different categories from sort of simplest to most complex. Awesome. And my name is Jason, Assistant Director and Curriculum Director of the Montana Digital Academy at the fabulous State Virtual School in lovely Missoula, Montana. And I blog at blog.ncc the Northwest Council for Computer Education, and I'm available on Twitter where I regularly share links of things that I'm reading, interested in, tech savvy teach. Um, we broadcast um, most weeks um, uh, at um, 8, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central. Um, we've been changing around platforms lately. We're working on trying to find the, the best platform from an audio quality standpoint, but you can always find where we're um, at our uh, Twitter account, EdTechSR is our uh, Twitter account, and you can find us um, on Stitcher Radio and wherever finer podcasts are aggregated, um, and you can feel free to join us live. Uh, we're, we will uh, almost be a live platform to record this, no matter what we use to record our audio, and we appreciate when you can join us every week, whether it's uh, live or after the fact um, in our podcast broadcast so feel free to tweet at us um uh let us know that you're listening what you like what you would like to hear more of and we appreciate you listening to the edtech situation have a great week over and out